We began last week to talk about how important it is for us to center our lives on truth. If you remember, I had the record and I attempted to drill a hole and it was off-centered and we tried to hear that off-centered does not sound very, very good. Well, as we think about centering our lives upon truth, we began by talking about the truth about truth. And because untruth warps the record and distorts the song, we are trying to un unearth some realities of truth that we need to center our lives around. Now, untruth is pretty easy for us to center on. Abraham Lincoln one time said, no man has a good enough memory to make a successful liar. <laughs> if you tell untruth, you have to remember what you told. And so that uh, is the point I believe that he is making. Austin O'Malley said, those who think it's permissible to tell white lies soon become colorblind. And Augustine wrote, when regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things will remain doubtful. Whenever we break down what is true, then all of a sudden doubt enters. Here's a, a little poem about the importance of truth. First somebody told it, then the room couldn't hold it. So the busy tongues rolled it till they got it outside. Then the crowd came across it and never once lost it, but tossed it and tossed it till it grew long and wide. This lie brought forth others, dark sisters and brothers and fathers and mothers, a terrible crew. And while headlong they hurried, the people they flurried and troubled and worried as lies always do. And so evil-bodied this monster lay goaded till at last it exploded in smoke and in shame. Then from mud and from mire the pieces flew higher and hit the sad victim and killed a good name. Untruth. The ramifications of a lack of truth are many and the applications are many. But what we want to talk about is why truth is so significant, why it becomes so important for us to make sure and avoid the untruth and to settle our lives, center our lives around the things that are true. Last time we talked about the truth about truth, and primarily I tried to just make two basic points. One is that our individual subjectivism makes it impossible for humans to be the establishers of objective truth. In other words, because we do not have sufficient knowledge to draw an absolute truth conclusion, we are not capable of establishing objective truth. And then the second thing that we tried to point out last time was that objective truth, absolute truth, has, has to have a theological connection. There has to be a standard bigger than humanity that establishes truth since we are not capable of establishing truth. And so that was where we got last time and we looked at some things about that. Today I want to talk about the center of certainty. The center of certainty. God is that compulsory ingredient for, un for authenticating absolute truth. He is the one that we must rely on to give us the knowledge of that which is true. Hebrews chapter 1, the Hebrew writer wrote, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the universe. The text lets us know that God's communication to humanity has taken on various forms. He has done it differently through different stages of history. The Hebrew writer says there was a time when he spoke directly. Now he speaks to us through his son. What I want to, however, notice as we begin this morning is that since God is true and he is the source of what is true, we should find that his communication has always been truthful regardless of how he revealed it. 
In other words, there should be a continuity of truth that goes through every form in which God relayed his message to mankind. When he, for example, spoke to people, he had to speak truth. When he had the message spoken through Christ, he had to speak truth. When he had the Holy Spirit help the apostles and direct the apostles into speaking and writing all truth, it had to be truth. So there needs to be a consistency from time beginning until time end where God is the provider, the giver of certain truth. So let's begin with this. During the patriarchal period, the God of truth spoke directly to family patriarchs. And we read through the Old Testament and we become aware that he, he spoke to many of the family leaders, gave them specific commands and apparently instructions, some of which we don't have, but many of which we do. The question I want us to ask is, was God's communication to those people, was it true? Was it truth? When God communicated with people directly, did he communicate truly? And I just want to notice a couple of examples. The first one, uh, I think I'll be able to explain why I chose him in just a moment. God spoke directly to a gentleman named Noah. And we read this in Genesis chapter 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw how corrupt the earth was, for all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, I've decided to put an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Therefore, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. God spoke to Noah, said, I'm going to destroy the earth. Genesis chapter 6 through 8 indicate that what God spoke to Noah was indeed true. We read about instructions to build a boat. We read about the specifics of that boat, the materials, the measurement. We read about 40 days of rain and 40 nights of rain. We read about the ark rising above the highest point on earth. We read about the destruction of all that lived except for the eight people and the animals that God had directed to be upon the boat. Was that true? Did God speak truth to Noah? The reason I selected Noah is because there are a whole lot of things today in our world that science looks at and wants to offer certain explanations for, which the easiest and the most logical solution and explanation for are a flood that covered the whole earth. A gentleman named uh, Coffin has written, a, uh, has written about six identifying marks, and he's a geologist, has his doctorate in this. Here's what he says, these things indicate that the flood of Noah's day was indeed a flood that covered the whole earth. Now, this is going to be really important and significant to us because we witness what just a little bit of water has done in Nebraska. And you, and you watch the devastation of, of life and of land and roads and bridges. And imagine what a worldwide catastrophic flood would do. So this gentleman just wants to say, you know, there are things, there are things we observe in this world that give credence to the biblical account of the flood. And the first one is, there's evidence of fast-moving water. He would cite that the sediments that are hundreds of feet thick exist worldwide, not just in specific areas, but that there are throughout the entire globe very thick deposits that are impossible to have been laid down by slow thousands and billions of years. They had to happen quickly. And he says that's worldwide. That's one of the evidences, the things we see. He talks about the fact that there are washed rock, again, that are found all over. Granite, for example, from the Rocky Mountains are deposited in Alberta, Canada, which is hundreds of miles away. How is that going to happen? Again, we witness how things get carried along in a, in a torrent of Nebraska floodwaters, imagine how things would be carried along in a worldwide flood. Thirdly, he says that the rock beds that, uh, that are traced for thousands of miles are indications that there had to be an immense amount of water to lay those rock beds down. For example, the red walls that we witness in the Grand, in the Grand Canyon are traceable all the way into Canada, all the way over to Niagara Falls, and as far south as the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, all deposited by some immense amount of water. 
He talks about the fish fossils. You know, you don't have to study fossils very long before you begin to see all of these fossils of a, of a fish. It looks like the, the skeleton is just intact and it's just uh, like the fish just laid down. Well, he points out the fact that bones uh, not scattered around and, and those skeletons being together indicates a very fast burial. That in normal existence, when a fish dies, it floats in the water. The flesh rots, the bones fall apart, and they drift away. What happened to cause the fossilization of a complete fish? And again, these are, these are multiple thousands of these uh, uh, viewable in any number of places. He says it had to be a massive flood. He talks about the massive plant and animal graveyards, thousands, even millions of fish, dinosaurs, and mammals in North America, Europe, and Africa. He points out how, if you can imagine, as the waters rise, where are animals going to go? They're going to seek out the highest place. They're going to be together. They're going to congregate. And then what's going to happen if the water keeps rising? They're going to be in one location. They're all going to die in the same place. And that becomes an evidence of a worldwide catastrophic deluge. Also, the diverse fossil mixtures. Animals from different geographical locations and habitat. For example, fresh and saltwater fish fossils being in the same location. All of those become, become proofs that God's word to Noah was true. Did God speak truth to Noah? As we look at our world today, we have evidence, physical, viewable evidence. What God said was true. God also spoke to Abraham, and then we get to Genesis chapter 12, and the Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be blessed. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, who treat you with contempt and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, did God speak truth to Abraham? Did God tell him the truth? Obviously, we look at the life of Abraham and we find out that he, he wondered, didn't he? He was uncertain about this truthfulness. And so there, there's another child through another woman because Abraham doesn't know if God's really spoken the truth. But then he gets some visitors and they say, it's happening. And Sarah's in the tent overhearing this, and she laughs. But Isaac is born. Did God keep his word? Well, about 1,300 years after God made the promise, here's a comment that Isaiah makes. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were dug, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you in pain. When I called him, he was only one. I blessed him and made him many. Did God keep his word? Was God's word true to Abraham? You ask any modern Jew about their ancestry, and who will they say they are direct descendants of? Abraham. Abraham. Those are just two examples of God speaking during the time that we identify as the patriarchal period to individuals, and what he spoke to them was true. And we could go through all of the occasions in which God spoke, and he spoke truth during that period of time. Then we come upon the time of the Mosaic Law. And again, we ask the question, did God speak truth? You'll remember that the Mosaic Law gave not only religious, but it also gave social instructions. So it was not only to govern them spiritually, but it was also to govern them as a society, as a nation of people. And all of those rules, all of those regulations, if you've been following the Bible reading, you've, you've, you've got through those, right? You, you suffered through all of the rules and all the regulations. And we understand that God was giving them those things for their own good. Were they true? The psalmist will write, your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Yet you are near, O Lord, and all your commands are true. The sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. 
of the law, the psalmist says, all of those things were true. Centuries later, while in Babylonian captivity, it's interesting what Daniel writes about the Mosaic law. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not appeased the Lord our God by turning from our injustice and paying attention to your truth. Daniel says the reason all this has happened, the reason we are in captivity is because we did not pay attention to God's truth, to his law. So when God was speaking directly to the patriarchs, he spoke truth. When God was giving the law of Moses, religious and social laws, he was speaking truth. And that gets us to the period we identify as the Christian dispensation. Did God speak truth within the message there? We begin in John chapter 1. The word became flesh. We recognize from what happens preceding this that that word was Christ. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and what? Truth. Jesus coming from God, full of grace and full of truth. John testified concerning him and explained this is the one of whom I said, the one coming after me surpasses me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For although the law was given through Moses, was the law true? Yes. Although there was truth given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So God spoke truth. To the patriarchs, he spoke truth in the law, and now he's speaking truth through the word of Christ. You'll remember in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You'll recall that we looked at earlier that Jesus said his purpose in coming, he told Pilate, was to testify to the truth. He told his disciples that what he told them was the message that the Father had given him. So he was speaking truth from God to them. The Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, was going to direct the apostles into all truth. The early believers heard the words of truth, which was the gospel of their salvation. Ephesians 1 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In him, when you believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we have a truth that came through Jesus in the Christian dispensation. Jesus spoke the truth. Jesus directed the truth to his apostles through the work of the Holy Spirit. They told the truth. When people heard that truth, it became to them the gospel by which they were saved. Truth. Truth. Those saved by the gospel of truth are contrasted by those who perish because they don't love, not the gospel, they don't love the truth. Here's how Paul wrote it in Thessalonians. And with every unrighteous deception among those who are perishing, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to be saved. Truth. Truth has been revealed. Truth is what saves. The saved church then, the group of people who were saved by the gospel of truth, who heard that and responded to that, the church of the, early, of the, of the first century became the pillar and the foundation of what? Truth. God had spoken it. God had it written by Moses. He had it revealed through Jesus, and the church became the pillar, that which held up truth. And its obedience to God's truth continues to grow and sanctify those who are a part of that saved body. Paul, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, with the faith of God's elect to the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. 
So as saved people continue to humble themselves before the truth, it continues to direct them farther and farther into becoming more godly. God's truth. First John says this is how we are sure that we have come to know God by keeping his commands. The one who says I have come to know him without keeping his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. Because God has revealed that truth. To deny that makes us a liar. So although God's method of dealing with humanity has differed, patriarchal, mosaic, Christian dispensation, with each period of time, God reveals nothing but what is true. Truth is so, it so permeates who God is that regardless of how he deals with his creatures, he has to do it in absolute truth. There is no injustice in God. There is no ability to be untrue because God is true. It is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize, seize the hope that is set before us. You see, God's truthfulness is so unbending that it becomes to you and I the ability to seize his hope because he's true. He's true. I want you to contemplate the, the reality that it's impossible for God to be untrue. It's impossible for him to look the other way. He cannot be untrue. When I think of the wonders of heaven, one of the wonders of heaven has got to be that there will be nothing there but what is absolute truth absolute truth. No deception, nothing to hide. God in his fullness, in his glory as absolute truth and his children joining him. But there's the flip side. If that's going to be the greatest wonders, one of the greatest wonders of heaven, do you not think one of the greatest torments of hell will be all the untruth, all the lies, all the deception. People living for eternity in lies. I mean, after all, if you serve the father of lies, that's what you're going to have eternity, for eternity. It is God's truthfulness with humanity that has always been the basis of a full life. Jesus said, I came to give life and give it to the full. And truth is what leads to that fullness of life. This is not just a fact to be acknowledged. It is, it is the practiced certainty which centers our life. The fact that my life, if my life is going to experience all that it can be, it must be centered upon truth. Barner reported in 1991, an estimated 74% of Americans strongly agree with the statement, there is only one true God who is holy and perfect and who created the world and rules it today. 74% agreed with that. Now watch the trouble. Yet that same survey revealed that 67% either strongly agree or somewhat agree with the assertion that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Do we want it both ways? <laughs> Can we have it both ways? No. God is the center of certainty. There are so many great examples of life in the in things recorded of Abraham Lincoln. At one time he was dealing, just having some form of a discussion that turned very antagonistic with another person and it was getting nowhere and so seeking to 
bring them to some point of agreement so that they could maybe make some headway, Lincoln asked, asked this question. He says, well, let's, let's see how many legs does a cow have? And again, you can, just, you can just imagine this heated discussion and all of a sudden Lincoln just, well, just a minute. How many legs does a cow have? And the person responded, obviously, they're still hot, they're still antagonistic, and so their response comes with great disgust. And they say, four, of course. So then Lincoln says, that's right. Now suppose you call the cow's tail a leg. How many legs would a cow have? Why, five, of course. To which Lincoln said, that's where you're wrong. Calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Our world disagrees with many of God's truths today. And so although the survey will say, yes, we believe in an absolute God who is alive and at work and but absolute truth, uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's a tail out here that I'm going to call a leg. We can't have it both ways. We can't have it that way. But our world is wanting us to identify any number of tails <laughs> as being true. And they're not. God is the source of all truth. And regardless of how arrogant and bold and disgusting the claims of our subjective society become that doesn't make those things true. Because our creator is the center of all that is certain. God offers the certainties by which a centered life is possible. The question is, are we living that kind of centered life? Is that where we have come in our existence? First of all, are we in Christ? You know, that gospel which is true, which brings us to salvation, that gospel that we first have to hear, we have to believe in it, then we repent to conform our lives to what is taught in it, we confess Jesus before people, we put our old person to death in baptism, we're resurrected to walk in newness of life, and we are clothed in Christ. That's centering our life on God's truth. Are we walking in Christ? Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that we are to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We've been called in truth. Is God's truth centered in our life in such a way that we are walking in truth? And later on in that same chapter, there will be a discussion about how we need to grow in that truth. Are we successfully growing in the truth of God? being centered on the certainties of our Creator. We've talked about the truth about truth. God is our only hope for understanding what is absolutely true. 